So really, as we think about how this afternoon has been structured, we look at the question of mindset in innovative thinking around these uh, both needs, challenges, and opportunities. We think about a deep understanding of the environment within which we live and how do we understand ecosystems and the dynamics of those ecosystems. Uh, but we also live in an environment of great leadership on a county and city level dedicated to specific and measurable tactics and plans to constructively engage uh, these areas of profound need and concerns that we all share. And so now we have the opportunity to hear the specifics of those things with our next guests, both um, this presentation and the following presentation. Uh, first, it's my pleasure to introduce Gary Jarrow, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer for the County of Los Angeles, and Dominique Cargraves, who is the Deputy Chief Sustainability Officer for the City of Los Angeles, and a CBA alum of LMU, very proud of that. So, um, Gary and Dominique, if you could kindly just be, uh, get yourself set up while I uh, set up the technology. I'm Gary Jarreau, uh, as and I want to just first express my deep appreciation to, to Professor Theis and to the entire LMU campus for inviting me to be here today. It's, it's a real honor and privilege to be able to talk to uh, all of you and to really, I, I mean, I, I came in a little bit late, but not too late. I've heard most of the win-win and, and, the, and the ecosystem resilience presentations and uh, it's just great to be able to take the time to, to learn new things and, and hear such interesting ideas and hopefully we can be uh, equally engaging ourselves. Uh, also, just saying to, to Dominique, this is my first time on this campus, so thank you for finally, as a native Angelino, getting me uh, to LMU. <laughs> um, so, I want to talk about uh, the county's sustainability plan. You've heard a little bit already about the county, I don't need to tell you too much more. It's, it's a big place, clearly, um, uh, with a lot of diversity. Our office was actually created uh, three years ago. I've been, I've been in the job almost three years now. And really, the, the idea of the Board of Supervisors when deciding to create a Chief Sustainability Office was they felt like the, the county needed to have a centralized vision and voice around sustainability issues. That we had, uh, we had been doing some good things in the county, but they were never coordinated. Uh, there wasn't essentially a, a strategic approach to those, uh, those initiatives. They were sort of ad hoc. Uh, and so the, the county board of supervisors decided to create the, the, our office. And, and one of the things I said to them, and it goes directly to the, to the last presentation, this idea of city-states, uh, when, when they were looking to hire somebody, I said, you know, if you hire me, I'm going to take an approach of working with all 88 cities uh, throughout the county, all 10 plus million people, on an approach that actually drives sustainability from a regional scale. Um, we have authority, land use authority and other kinds of authorities where there isn't a city and there's more than a million people in parts of the county where there isn't a city, uh, but that, that wasn't you're not going to solve these issues by focusing on where you have direct authority. You really need partnerships and cooperation, and, and that's why we're partnered here today. We worked very closely with the city of Los Angeles. So just, uh, again, I think you got some of this already, kind of the size and scale of uh, Los Angeles County. Uh, you know, 200 languages are spoken here, 75 miles of coastline, desert, mountains, uh, wetlands, not much, but uh, certainly was a wet place at one time. La Cienega means the swamp uh, because there actually was water that flowed throughout this, this region. Um, you know, from an economic standpoint, this is a business school. Uh, we actually have about a trillion dollar economy in Los Angeles County. If we were our own country, uh, we would be a member of the G20. We are the largest manufacturing county in the entire United States. We have three electric vehicle manufacturing plants in LA County. We manufacture all kinds of things. So, those are just pretty pictures. I'm not going to talk too much about, uh, and that's really just a, something to look at while I talk about how big the government is. The, the government itself is, uh, is uh, 110,000 employees. It's, uh, it's one of the largest employers in the region. We have 40 county departments covering absolutely everything and anything that you can imagine that a government might cover. Uh, so 
when the, when the board uh, established our office, it, it essentially gave us uh, a primary task, which was to go create a, a countywide sustainability plan. Uh, and we as staff uh, decided to uh, think about what a sustainability plan could and should be for the county of Los Angeles, this big, unwieldy, diverse place. Um, and we certainly wanted it to be regional. I mentioned that. That was kind of my initial approach to the, the position. We knew that it had to be aspirational. We wanted to, to set a course for this county. We wanted it to be long term, but we do have short term and medium term targets. Uh, but we wanted it to be actually something that we could actionize uh, or be actionable. And so those were some of the parameters that we set for ourselves. And then we thought a lot about this question of where do we have authority versus where do we have influence. And we can't uh, impose our will on those 88 cities throughout the county. Um, we can only help them and support them. So that's an influence role. We also have influence, all five supervisors on the Board of Supervisors sit on the board of the Metro Transportation Agency. So we have influence on the transportation system. A supervisor sits on the South Coast Air Quality Management District. So we have influence on air quality policy and regulation in the region. But we really wanted the plan to be mostly about what we could do ourselves. Uh, and when we do it ourselves in the unincorporated areas, the idea is that uh, it serves as a model or as a template for other cities. Now, the city of LA doesn't need a model of template. They, they are a model and template in and of themselves. But there's lots of other cities that do need that kind of support. And that's really the role we see ourselves playing. So we sat down. We looked at sustainability plans from around the world. Uh, did an, an analysis, said, here's the things we think we want to cover in our sustainability plan here in Los Angeles County. Came up with this framework. Uh, and it, some of it doesn't surprise you, of course. It's traditional environmental media like air and energy and water and climate and solid waste and parks and open space. But we also said how the city and how the region is designed is part and parcel of these issues. So we needed to make sure we're addressing land use and transportation and housing. This is, we're not living a sustainable community if we have 60,000 people living on our streets every night. If we have 60,000 homeless, we're not sustainable. That is not a sustainable way of life. So we need to, we need to address housing. Of course, we're the public health agency for the region, so we took a very clear public health and well-being lens. Um, and then we thought about two issues. One, you just heard about, resilience. And we said, well, resilience is really part and parcel of all these things. We, we're worried, we're thinking about the resilience of our energy systems or the resilience of our water systems or the resilience uh, uh, of our communities to the impacts that climate change are going to have. So we need to have resilience in everything. But then this question of equity came up. And you know, the classic definition or shorthand definition of sustainability is that it's environment, economy, and equity. And in many cases, we saw sustainability plans where there was an equity chapter. And that's a fine way of doing it. But we said equity is simply too important to Los Angeles County to, to relegate to a chapter. We're going we're gonna to think about social justice across all these categories. And the, the rationale for that is, is this. The, the state of California has a tool they call the California Environmental Screen, Cal Enviro Screen. And it looks at socioeconomic data and pollution exposure data, whether it's toxics, air pollution, water, water quality. And it marries that socioeconomic and, and environmental data. And it identifies census tracts that it deems as disadvantaged communities. These are disadvantaged because they're low income, they're communities of color, and they suffer disproportionately impacts of pollution. Half of all of the census tracts in the state of California that are deemed the most severely disadvantaged are in Los Angeles County. Half. So how can we address questions of sustainability when we have such a, such a disproportionate impact? We, you know, we've got a big population, or we're a quarter of the population of the state, but we're half of the disadvantaged communities. So equity became a critical factor. So that was the work we had done uh, as, a, as a sustainability office. And then we said, let's go talk to people. Let's not write a plan uh, and, and put it out to the public. Let's just go talk to people. And this was this, this idea of uh, the, the bringing all parties together, right? And so we held 
literally uh, almost 200 meetings over the course of, of 18 months. Uh, some of them very long, intensive, six hour, come for the entire day. And, and to really get to this question of equity, uh, we actually hired five environmental justice organizations to help us organize in communities and get people to our, to our meetings. And then we told those community organizations, these may be a small two or three person community based organization, we know it's a big burden for you to come for six hours we'll give you a stipend, we'll pay you. And we ended up paying almost 100 organizations to come participate and tell us what, from their lived experience on the ground, what sustainability could and should mean to them. Of course, we, we met with cities. We wanted to make sure we were, we were engaging cities. Uh, we met with all the tribal, or at least we invited in all the tribal nations of the region to, to talk to the tribes about, one, what's your experience today on the land? Uh, how did you manage the land in the past? What lessons can we learn? And what do we need to know as we, as we address these issues? So that's how we created our sustainability plan. There's, these, are, these are the environmental justice organizations that we hired. Um, through that process, we developed some 6,000 ideas. We narrowed it down. Ultimately, wrote a plan that had uh, about 150 actions. And I'm proud that uh, uh, about two months ago, the LA County Board of Supervisors approved that plan uh, unanimously uh, and gave us direction to move forward towards implementation, which is really the most critical part. So let me talk just a bit about what's in the plan. I don't want to go on too long. I want to make sure Dominique has plenty of time as well. Uh, one of the things that's unique about the plan is that we organized it around 12 cross-cutting goals. So if you go to the plan, and I encourage you to go to see it online at ourcountyla.org, um, you won't see an energy chapter. You won't see a climate change chapter. And this is because what we heard from the community uh, as, we were, as we were gathering ideas was that all of these things are interrelated. They're all connected. Uh, you know, and an example of that is how do we manage the rainwater? How do we manage storm water that falls? And one of the ways of managing that water is to build parks and green space that can capture and absorb and infiltrate that water. So you've got a water program but you've also got now a parks and open space program. And, and if you infiltrate that water, you don't need to import as much water. And besides the uh, city of LA where it's all gravity, the rest of the state actually uses a tremendous amount of energy to move the water from north to south. So if you reduce the demand for water from Northern California, you've now got an energy reduction. You've got a benefit there, which means you've got an air pollution and climate pollution reduction, which means you've got a public health impact. So one thing touches everything. And our, our goals reflect that. From there, we went down to a set of strategies that are how do we get to that goal, and then the down to about 159 specific actions. Uh, and these are the, the examples of the high-level goals. These are the first six. You can see they're nice, broad statements of a kind of desired future state. Um, we buried the most controversial one, which was number seven here on the second slide, uh, to, to eliminate fossil fuels from LA County. Uh, and we actually said in the document, uh, and when I wrote this down on paper for the first time, that we would uh, eliminate fossil fuels from LA County. I, I thought the hand of Chevron or whomever might come down and smite me, um, but, but uh, you know, we survived. Uh, but we actually say we want to, there's, there's still, we, you saw in the slide, this is, this is a county based on oil. There's still 4,000 active oil wells, and we said we want to shut down those oil wells. And of course, the oil industry came to us and said, you can't do that, that you know, there's a demand for these products, they're just gonna be replaced with worse product from elsewhere. And we said, well, we get that, there's not perfect substitution in an economic sense, but sure, there's gonna be some substitution, but we're gonna go after this, the demand for your product too, so don't worry, we're not just trying to shut you down, we're trying to shut down the demand for what you, what you produce. Um, and we have strategies in there around decarbonizing buildings, eliminating natural gas from, from buildings, about transportation electrification. Everywhere we could eliminate fossil fuels, we'll look to do that. So the last thing I really wanted to talk about, and that's, that's a real brief overview of the plan itself, but one of the, the things I want to drill down on today given the, the, the title of, of this, this uh, seminar is really thinking about the climate and climate risk. And one of the things that we're going to do is a comprehensive climate vulnerability assessment. 
Uh, and this is something that hasn't been done for the entire county of Los Angeles. And what we're going to look at is, of course, uh, heat impacts, wildfire impacts, sea level rise, flooding, uh, vectors, which is a uh, you know, disease that may change, disease uh, parameters that may change in the future based on, on a change in climate, and how that impacts people. So wh who, who's vulnerable, what kinds of populations are vulnerable, and where? Uh, is, it, is it elderly to heat? Uh, is it people who live, in, who live uh, in, along uh, the LA River to flooding? You know, what are the vulnerable populations, and how do we get to them? Uh, and, and also then look at physical infrastructure. What's the risks of all of these things to physical infrastructure? Uh, and you know, what, what was telling to me, and this is actually an article I just found last week, and I actually sent it to the CEO of, of the county, who's, who was back in New York talking to the bond rating agencies for the county's bonds. And the bond rating agencies asked her when she was in New York, what are you in the county doing about climate change? How are you starting to manage these risks? And Moody's last week came out and said, we actually will downgrade the bonds of cities if they're not actively addressing these issues. So this is not just because it's the right thing to do. There's, there's real financial implications. So this is a, a map, and I, this is where I want to kind of talk about where we're going to be looking at these impacts. The, 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 these are uh, census tracts that are uh, highly polluted or are exposed. And if you look at this map, you can see the clear outlines of the freeways in LA County. Uh, so any census tract along a freeway is highly at risk uh, from, from pollu toxic pollution. But you can also see the concentrations in south and southeast LA uh, of, of census tracts, and then even going down towards the, the harbor area. Um, and if you overlay that with things like heat, here's a, a heat, uh, this was actually taken by JPL, uh, surface temperatures just last summer, uh, and if you note the scale goes up to 140 degrees, there were places in LA County where it was 140 degrees on the ground. And then you look at flooding. Of course, we saw, again, this, you know, this idyllic vision for the LA River. It is a flood control channel. Uh, and what, what works maybe in the San Fernando Valley upriver may not work downriver, given that now you've got all of the water accumulating in one place. And you see the kinds of communities that are at risk of flooding. Low-income communities, Southgate, Bell Gardens, Compton. So we're, those are the kinds of things we'll be, we're going to need to develop strategies around. And of course, wildfire. Uh, we know wildfire is, is part of our environment, uh, but fires are getting uh, more frequent, they're getting more intense, uh, and we, we actually had our budget analysts in the county uh, ask me, uh, they said, the fire department says it needs more resources because of climate change. You think that's real? I'm like, yes it is, <laughs> give them the more resources. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's affecting the way we do budgeting. The last thing uh, I, I'm going to stop here is one of the strategies we're thinking about in, in, in a business school, you think about real estate, is how do we prevent exposing people to wildfire in the first place? And we're building, you know, you saw the, the demographics, we're going up to 11 million and ultimately up to 13 million people in LA County. And we're building in places that are highly vulnerable to wildfire. And the question for us was, how do you, how do you stop that? How do, you, how do you direct new growth, new development? We know people are coming. We know we need uh, housing, but where do we put it? And the idea is to, that we came up with is this idea of transferring the development rights. So if you own 40 acres out in uh, the Antelope Valley up against the hills, and you want to put 200 homes there, you have a right to put 200 homes there by code, by zoning. What if we said, instead of building there, we'll allow you to build, maybe it's 200 homes, maybe it's less, maybe it's more, depending on the economics, what's the equivalent, uh, 200 homes, say, in Altadena, along Lake Boulevard, where you know, the current density is two- and three-story buildings, we'll let you build a five-story building in, in Altadena instead to accommodate that growth, um, but to move people into less risky areas. Not that Altadena is all that less risky either, because it's against the foothills, but you get the idea. 
Um, and so the reason I show this picture is because this is a perfect ex illustration of where this was used. It wasn't used for wildfire risk, it was used for historic preservation. The, 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 the building in the foreground, of course, is the Los Angeles Central Library in downtown Los Angeles. And the, the tall building behind it is, is known as the Library Tower. And the reason it's known as the Library Tower is that it is taller than zoning allows for it to be, or at least it was taller than zoning allowed for it to be when it was built. And what they did was they bought the air rights above the library. The library basically said, we will never build up to what we're uh, legally allowed to. We're going to stay the same height we are. We're a historic building. And they sold the rights to the building across the street. So you can transfer these kinds of rights. Um, and that's something we'd like to do with, with FIRE. And I'll leave it at that. Is this on? All right. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to be back on campus. So I was here from 2000 to 2004, and most of my classes were in this building. So it's a real pleasure to be back. And um, I hope that your LMU Lion journey um, holds everything that you're hoping for. Um, when I started here, I knew I was interested in real estate. Um, I was the kind of kid that grew up in Orange County, and every weekend my mom and I went to the new model homes for all the new tracks that were opening around Irvine and, and in that area. So I knew upon graduation I would want to be doing some type of work in the real estate field. And so that's exactly what I went to do. Um, I was recruited by Pulte Homes. And um, they're one of the largest um, production, new construction home builders in the United States. And I got to work on a variety of projects out in Antelope Valley and Palmdale area. Um, but I really missed LMU and I missed kind of the vibrancy of city living. And so luckily I got a call from uh, another developer. And at this point in the city of LA, the um, laws had just changed which were encouraging adaptive reuse for buildings. So we have a lot of buildings um, in downtown Los Angeles that were once uh, used for manufacturing or um, you may have, have come across maybe the biscuit company lofts or the toy store lofts and, and all of these had another purpose. Um, but when um, this, this new idea about policy and, and reusing and adapting um, buildings that already existed into new places and vibrant places for people to live came about. Um, it started a whole new development trend. Um, from there, I got to go work um, in a similar but slightly um, different spot, which you probably now know as South Park. Um, this was pre um, this was pre LA Live, and so the place has changed a lot. Um, I'm telling you all this just to show you um, how interesting your LMU journey can be, and how um, you can find yourself in the right place at the right time. Um, so at the South Park, we were developing the first three new construction high rise condo towers, and the developer was from Portland. And Portland, as you know, is very, very sustainable. And they've done really interesting work in developing neighborhoods and districts, such as the Pearl District, if you've, if you've been up um, to visit that area. And so it was a brand new world to be doing new construction and high rise, and most importantly, um, LEED. And so these were the first LEED new construction projects. And this is when the LEED rating system was meant for office buildings. So we were trying to apply a, a rating system for a very different use type to a high rise, but one that was with demised units for people to live in. So all this was very challenging and fun. And this leads me to the next part of my journey, which was going to work with the US Green Building Council. So I ran the Los Angeles office for a number of years. And then I joined the city team about one year ago. So now I am in the mayor's office of sustainability. And I have a focus on green buildings and the decarbonization of our built environment, which is a real challenge because um, let's take a guess. How many people think we have a million buildings in the city of Los Angeles existing right now? 
I think it's less than a million. We don't know. It, okay, it is north of two million existing buildings just in the city of Los Angeles. So um, it can be an enormous challenge, but also provides a lot of opportunity for, for people to get involved. And so I hope that if real estate has a calling for you, like it did for me, that perhaps you will be part of building decarbonization into the future, which is you know really thinking about how we have a built environment that encourages a livable, thriving, healthy city for Angelinos. So this is LA's Green New Deal. And this is the product of um, several years of work from our team and a variety of um, consultants um, and community stakeholders that helped us put together this sustainable city plan. So the original plan came out in 2015 and we knew come 2019 we would reevaluate the plan, we would accelerate some of the targets and um, also add new concepts because sustainability is ever evolving and ever changing. And so here's my beauty shot of LA to, <laughs> to serve as my background. So um, our population is um, north of 4 million people. Um, and our area covers over 468 square miles. This is quite expansive. And um, just so you have a, an idea about, about how the city works, our mayor, um, who I saw is going to be on campus next week, so I hope you go see him, um, appoints commissioners and heads of city departments. And so this really helps um, ingrain sustainability throughout all of the different workings of the city. So the Department of Transportation, the um, Department of City Planning, the Department of Water and Power, the airports, the ports, um, all of these city um, entities are, are connected through this network. And so the mayor um, you know, takes great care in appointing people um, that, that really uphold the priorities um, into these positions. Um, we also create an annual budget. The mayor um, brings this to city council and um, that will also determine how sustainability gets done around the city. So um, it's a unique situation that the mayor's office of sustainability is actually within the office of budget and innovation. So we literally sit next to the procurement team the budget analysts, um, and city homelessness as well. So um, that kind of setup can be, can be really good in making sure that sustainability priorities get funded. And so we've talked a lot today about um, climate and risk and the health impacts and, and how tough it is out there right now. And so I'm not going to stay too long on this slide, but I'm going to say that, you know, for all of these reasons and for everyone in this room, um, it, was, it was very important that our sustainable city plan would ensure that the city of Los Angeles upholds the Paris Climate Agreement. Because even though the president is wishing to pull us out, cities are still in and cities have the power to make these kinds of changes and positively influence um, future generations. And so what is it? Um, I mentioned before in 2015 um, the release of the original plan, 2019, um, you know, really is an expanded vision and an accelerated vision because we know we have to get to 100% renewable energy. We have to zero out emissions from buildings and transportation. And prior to this particular plan, um, we did not have the science-based targets that we do now. To get to these science-based targets, we needed to do a decarbonization analysis and understand from our emission inventory, where do the emissions in the city of LA come from? And how can we ratchet them down over time to become a carbon neutral city and uphold Paris? 
So these are the key principles, the real backbone of LA's Green New Deal, which is upholding Paris, delivering environmental justice and equity, ensuring every Angelino has the ability to join the green economy, and leading by example. So this means when we say we're going to decarbonize buildings, we're gonna start with our city buildings and, and ensure that um, we're always walking the walk. Or walking the walking the talk, walking the <laughs> something. However, that saying goes. Um, so here's our wedge. You can see the different colors indicate emissions from industry. So some people are surprised to know that buildings are actually the number one source of emissions within the city of LA. Everyone kind of defaults to transportation. Um, however, it is buildings. Transportation is is although you know a very very close second. So, um, this is the big challenge, getting to 2050 and reducing emissions from all of these sectors. This is a very simplified framework to think about how to do this, um, which is we must be delivering clean energy, 100% renewable energy. Um, this is the backbone to cleaning up emissions from buildings. Next, we need zero carbon transportation systems. We need to achieve zero waste and also zero wasted water. So I quickly wanted to dive into two chapters of the plan um, as appropriate for this, this setting. Um, first of all, housing and development. I mentioned the science-based targets and these are what you see on, on the right-hand side. Um, first of all, ending street homelessness by 2028. Um, is a crucial target, and as Gary said before, a sustainable city does not have you know homeless people living in the streets every evening. Um, next, we're going to increase cumulative new housing unit construction to 150,000 by 2025, and ensure 57 percent of new housing units are built within 1,500 feet of transit. And this is another really interesting policy lever that's been very effective. Um, we have a program called Transit Oriented Communities, and this is um, working so that developers that are building projects within half a mile of um, transit stops are able to get a density bonus, have less restrictions on parking, um, as long as they are within that distance and they are setting aside units for affordable housing. So we actually beat this 57% um, number so far this year. Our permits that have been issued in 2019 to date are at 60% um, issued through using the transit-oriented communities. So also we need to create or preserve 50,000 income restricted affordable housing units and increase stability for renters. Clean and healthy buildings is, is my favorite chapter of the plan. Um, although there's only two targets, they're both very, very um, exciting. So all new buildings will be net zero carbon by 2030 and 100% of buildings will be net zero carbon by 2050. I'm gonna get into definitions on the next slide because net zero carbon um, has a lot of possible meanings and can be confused with net zero energy as well. So we'll get into that in just a minute. The second target here is reducing building energy use per square foot for all building types, 22% by 2025, 34% by 2035 and 44% by 2050. And these two are important to go together because energy efficiency always comes first in buildings. And so here are some considerations for net zero energy, net zero carbon, and how all of that comes together. We're projecting 30% growth within the city of Los Angeles. So that is one factor in considering how are we going to drive emissions down to zero as we continue to grow as a city. Then we have to factor in SB 100, which is um, state law, meaning that we're going to have a clean grid by 2045. So in that instance, how do we ensure that the line 
um, looks appropriate with the inputs that we know we will be achieving through delivering 100% clean power um, through this trajectory. Now we have the Cal California Energy Commission's goals for the state, seeing that all new residential construction will be zero net energy by 2020. This has manifested as um, what people are calling a PV mandate. Um, so you'll find if you look into this that new construction homes starting January 1 um, are required to have a certain amount of uh, on-site solar. Um, so zero net energy, on-site solar, it's hard to um, exactly balance uh, whether those single family homes will be zero net energy, but still a move in the right direction. Um, also from the CEC, we have all new commercial construction um, goal for zero net energy by 2030. Um, then I won't go into the into the last two, but just a quick touch point on zero net energy versus zero net carbon. Um, zero net energy is generally defined as a building being able to produce as much energy as it will consume in a calendar year. And it's fascinating to think about because when we think of a building such as um, City Hall, it's, it's quite tall. It has very little roof space. So as you're thinking about the commercial application of zero net energy, um, how on earth are we going to produce enough energy um, from our very limited roof space to offset uh, the huge usage of a building that's occupied fully um, most days? So this is one of the challenges in thinking through um, energy use in building systems. So zero net carbon is defined by the World Green Building Council. And um, the loading order, I think, is right. This is, this is how we're approaching um, thinking holistically about, about buildings and new construction. So first, the key principle is to measure and disclose carbon. Next, reduce your energy demand. Then generate energy from renewables on site, then off site, and then the last resort is offsetting using carbon credits. So that is Los Angeles buildings in a nutshell. And um, yeah, it's been a real pleasure. I think we're gonna take questions. Yes, okay. Yes, please. Yeah, great question. Um, we have really reconsidered our approach and actually we're working really closely with the county on this because homelessness you know, does not know boundaries um, between one city or another. Um, we have a variety of initiatives and in what we call care teams. So our, our approach is not only to um, try to house people in um, shelters and that sort of thing, but actually to deliver services so that um, they are able to access showers, um, you know, help centers, and um, you know, receive the essential food and other things that they they desperately need. So, um, in terms of building, um, we have the mayor's a bridge home program. And so we are building 1,500 um, temporary shelter beds that'll be done um, over the next like six and eight months. And so that helps um, in one way. We heard earlier from Win Win about evictions and about um, people finding themselves in situations of living in their cars. And so we've also looked at city policy around that. So um, there was just news yesterday um, about work happening in city council around um, halting evictions. 
Um, there's also been safe parking programs so that if people are in situations of um, living in their cars that there are safe lots. And there are actually a lot of universities that are establishing um, safe parking because I, I was sad to learn there are over 10,000 um, homeless college students in Southern California as well. Um, Gary, did you want to add on to? Yeah, I think the only thing I'd say is, you know, the, 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 the last part about uh, how do you prevent people from falling into homelessness is critical. We actually last year housed 60,000 people who were on the streets. At the same time, 60,000 new people fell into homelessness. And so we're not keeping up, we're, we're falling behind. Uh, and so it really is, whether it's rent stabilization or anti-eviction ordinances, uh, that has to be part of it, of keeping people who are at risk of homelessness in homes so they don't become homeless in the first place. Uh, but then we do need to build a lot more housing. We simply have a severe housing shortage. Anybody, you know, everybody in this room recognizes that uh, the f housing is, is unaffordable, partly because of the shortage, a simple supply and demand sort of equation. Uh, countywide, our plan calls for the construction of uh, half a million new affordable housing units. Uh, because that's the number that, at a mere minimum, we need. And when I presented that to the California Realtors Association's folk, they said, no, we actually need about three times that. So we need to build a lot of housing. Yes, Miko. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one politically, of course, right? Because uh, people feel like they want their communities to stay the same, but the fact is communities never stay the same. Uh, communities evolve and they change over time and they, and they grow. Uh, you know, there was state legislation uh, and the state has taken some action against Huntington Beach in particular for not, not in the case of Huntington Beach, their, their plans don't even demonstrate the technical ability to meet their housing allocation numbers. Every city in, in California gets a target from the Southern California Association of Governments. And so we do need to, we do need to make sure that we're able to enforce those targets. Um, and in a good example of, of how you don't necessarily change a community's you know, total nature but allow for more housing is Minneapolis. And the, the city of Minneapolis has said, there is no much such thing as single family zoning anymore. You can, if you, you can build up to whatever height you're allowed to build up to in your community. That governs height restrictions and size restrictions. But if you want two units in that, in that building or three units in that building, you can have them. You can subdivide within the property. And that's something that we're doing in the county. We've started that on a trial basis in some communities. That doesn't change the overall look of the community. It brings more people to the community. But it is a way of starting to get to protecting the, at least the visual character of a community. So thank you very much. Just a couple of words of thanks and then a little bit of an introduction to our break, which we're going to have here in about 60 seconds. First, I'd like to thank you, Dominique and Gary, so very much for your presentation. Um, really what we're seeing as we're moving through these conversations is this idea of vision, of opportunity fueled by innovation, translated into strategies and tactics about improving broadly what it means to be a human community. And we see this reflected in very specific strategies and tactics because we take ideas and translate them into plans and actions. And so what we're going to do after our break is look at another leading example of this from the city of Long Beach and their work with AECOM. And then we're going to look specifically at commercial real estate development and some of the business drivers there, as well as um, uh, entrepreneurial uh, contributions and leading business examples engaging the same issue. Um, 
We are so very grateful to each of our speakers. And at the end of our symposium, I'll say a few words of thanks. We do have a small gift for each of our speakers of some LMU swag. Gary, this is the first time that you've come to LMU. You're gonna be leaving with our brand and the uh, Lions community in your heart. And we know this isn't the last time you're coming to LMU. And Dominique, we know you were one over years ago, so it's great to have you here as well. So we have a 20 minute break. Um, bathrooms are downstairs, signs are outside. We will reconvene at 535 on the dot.